Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the second episode of the Our Voice podcast. Tonight, we have another very, very, very special guest. I'm getting better at this. Um, we have Michael Landau with us. How you doing, Micah? Hey, how's it going? Yeah, so, Micah, you're a therapist here at Our Place. Wait, can I just say that you have one of the most podcast host-like voices I've ever heard in my life? Actually? As soon as I put the headphones on, it's like you were meant to do this. <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't have gone into a career of social work. Yeah, welcome to the club. I know, right? I, I, I also, like, once I started doing this, I developed a name for these. I call them potties. <laughs> They're not podcasts anymore. <laughs> They're potties. <laughs> Please don't tell anyone that I was on your potty. <laughs> Oh, uh, I don't know if we can go. We, we, we can't even move on from that. No, I think we have to start again. <laughs> no, I think we should continue. And I think Obviously. we should just change the topic of the... No, I think we should note that we have to start again and then go on in true our place fashion. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Exactly. Because why start again when we should just, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as I was saying before I discussed <laughs> this potty. No, not potty. Potty, potty. Anyways. That makes it better. Right. <laughs> Um, so you're a therapist here at our place. Sure. Right. Uh, you're here generally two nights a week, right? So I work here on Monday nights as a therapist, and then I try to come in on Thursdays just to volunteer and hang out with the guys. Which is awesome. Yeah. You know, a very big part of our place is not that aside from all the clinical work that we do behind the scenes, it's the in your face, we're just hanging out with the guys. Exactly. So that's really an important part of what we do here. I think that's really awesome also, like... The facts are is that, like like you said, you work here one night a week, but you then come in another night of a week to volunteer. How many organizations? You're not finding that in a clinical setting. You're not finding that in your standard career or organization where somebody will say, okay, here are my hours, and now I'm going to come voluntarily mm -hmm. on my own on a Thursday night because I'm part of this environment and this community. Sure, yeah. Um, I think that Sonny, yeah, it was Sonny Perlman who told me this. There's only one Sonny, so. Right, yeah. <laughs> Perlman is redundant. If I said Perlman, we would have to specify. Yeah, because it's you know, that many of too them. many. So but, many. <laughs> sorry, Sonny. <laughs> and Shim and Kiwi. <laughs> and Ellie and. Yeah, I don't know the rest. I know Gav what it, from Bolt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> anyway, you know, fresh out of school when I started working here as a therapist. Mm hmm. I asked Sani, how is it that I'm supposed to negotiate the therapeutic boundaries with my clients? You know, to most of my clients, the idea is that I'm almost like a blank slate that they can project anything onto. Mm -hmm. And then at our place, I hang out with the guy in the room for 45, 55 minutes, however long the session is. And then when we come outside, he'll watch me eat a bowl of chalent and schmooze with uh, <laughs> My, technically my colleagues but who are also really my buddies and maybe some of his friends maybe right. he'll even be in the conversation mm -hmm. and you know I had all these concerns about self-disclosure and so I asked Sani uh, you know is this ethical is this okay and he had a totally different approach to this he said I think what allows me to help guys is that I have these more informal boundaries and I've managed to walk that line between being a real human with them and hanging out in the room with them as a therapist as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's I think also the, the, and the fact that, you know, somebody is, is, is coming and talking to you and I think it makes it all the more real also. Mm -hmm. It's not just informal. It's not just like it's in a different setting. It's the fact that, you know, a lot of times somebody goes to therapy, right? Mm -hmm. And it's always like so awkward because like, you know, you hear all these stories from people like, oh, I was walking in the street and I saw my therapist and like, I didn't know what I should do. Should I wave to him? Should I smile? Yeah. I'm with a friend. But when you're in our place, I mean, we have our own guidelines and boundaries of, you know, when we see somebody outside of our place, you sure. know, like I, I, at least when, when I started here, I spoke to Yehuda about it. Mm. Um, he was my uh, Yehuda's supervisor. Yehuda's so great, by the way. Yehuda's fantastic. Yeah, he just I, I think, eases everyone in. You know? I, I know. I think every single podcast, I'm, I'm, I've only done, I've recorded three or four. I've mentioned his name. 
Yeah. And the drive is to get him onto Sonny's podcast and then our podcast. That would be great. I mean, I would love to have him on ours first. I just feel like, you know. I mean, that guy can be so invisible. Like, he can be behind the scenes. Yeah. But he's responsible for... When I started here as an intern, I interviewed with him. I would have questions. He would be there to talk yeah. to. And then he's guided every other intern since. Right. It's like you said, he, like people can... You won't notice him if you're mm-hmm. not involved. Right. And then once you step in you see that he's the bulk yeah and he every volunteer every, every intern. single every volunteer every intern every staff member interacts with him and the wisdom and the guidance that he can offer yeah is is, is and he's so dedicated and driven too i mean it's not for the are podcast. we doing an obituary <laughs> <laughs> i hope not but this guy gets up at like uh the crack of dawn and yeah. hangs out when he's at our place you know he Til- goes at 11 yeah but uh, it's it's true, but the point is, I asked him, mm-hmm. "Can he back?" And I, you know, I said, "What if I see a guy in the street or whatever it is?" He said, "You got to gauge each situation differently." Mm-hmm. And it it's, happens to be it's not that hard, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like the guys, let you know. Yeah, they do because like I, that's generally what it is. Like if the if the guy looks at you and he smiles and he mm-hmm. like waves you over or whatever, you know, it's appropriate. I can come over. I can whatever. I had this actually recently. I was walking with my family on a shop this morning. And we're walking down King's Highway and I saw one of the guys. Um, and I, I, I just like, I, he saw me, I smiled. And like, I don't know if he saw me, but like whatever, he kept walking. Mm-hmm. Anyways, the, I saw him during the week and I said, yo, I saw you on Shabbos, like whatever. He's like, oh, why didn't you come over? I'm like, well, I, I didn't know, like you're with your family and whatever. He's like, no, bro, you can always come over even if I'm wow. with my family. Yeah. The following Shabbos, I was walking with my family again. On King's Highway, oh, wow. and he saw me, and he came over and gave me such a big hug <laughs> on King's Highway. That's perfect. That's such an hour story. It was story. awesome. Yeah. yeah. But but that that line, that difference of sitting with a guy, and then you know, you're able to walk that line, oh. that informal line, I think is so much more beneficial, because they sure. see you for who you are. Yeah. And it's also really, it's what differentiates between, like you said, many clinics and our place as essentially a family and a community. Yeah. You know, I think this year during Simchas Beis HaSheva, I was walking down Kingston in Crown Heights and there were a bunch of our guys hanging out and I kind of walked, I didn't even notice them. And they were just like, oh wow, look, it's Micah, guys, this is crazy, you know? And I've had this happen everywhere from Brooklyn to Israel where I bumped into our guys in the streets of Jerusalem Yeah. and they hadn't even been here in two years, you know? And it's like we were both equally happy to see each other. Yeah, it's 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 like it's a family thing, and it doesn't matter how long you're apart from that person. Right. We're here, and like we spend enough time. Like, I could be sitting on the couch playing PS4 with you mm-hmm. for three weeks on end, yeah. and we're barely talking. Right. And I see you. You won't have a single meaningful conversation. Yeah. And then a year later, we're having. We're, you know, I'm in Israel, and I meet you there, mm-hmm. and it's like my long lost brother. Like, right. hey what's going on i think that's so special Mm -hmm. i I don't think that exists and on any other platform yeah i mean when i started working here uh mark alafashalam yeah he was working the front desk and he would play backgammon there was always an open backgammon board in front of him Mm -hmm. and he roped me into playing with him at some point and again i mark's a great guy or was yeah a little weird to say well yeah um, backgammon's a fun game, but I was like, I- I'm kind of supposed to be here working, right? Like, I had this very get to business attitude. And, you know, it-, it was almost laughable this idea that those two things are separate at our place. It's like, obviously, you sit down at the front desk and play backgammon with everyone who walks in, and this is how you build a connection with people. Exactly. Right? You're not just another stranger trying to fix them or see what their problem is or tell them how to live their lives. You're just there with them and for them. I, I I love that last part also. Mm-hmm. The the fact that we're not we there's no agenda. No. Which is like so uh, I mean uh, you went to you you you're you're in honors, you went to Hunter, right? <laughs> yeah. You went to Hunter. Hashif. Very yeah, sure. For uh, for the New York social work scene. Yeah. I mean I went to Wurzweiler, but right. it seems like that's the more common but I, I, I wanted to go to Hunter really badly. Yeah. Um uh, I'm not making excuses here. I missed the the deadline for app applying. <laughs> um, but like, it's not like when you're taught in school, mm-hmm. you know, none of these things, anything that goes on here, 
it, it's not it's not it's it's not taught yeah i mean these are things that really can't be taught you kind of have to learn them by doing them right like right. you can hear about this from some professor in a classroom in a total in a totally theoretical manner and then you spend a year at our place and you're like just a different person and you know? and it's and and it's as if i mean i don't know about your experience i mean mm -hmm. i learned a lot in school sure but i think that the experiences that i've had here mm -hmm. I'm not talking about clinically, professionally. I'm talking about just being a, a person. Being here has taught me to be a better person. Absolutely. I think I, I've grown on a human being connection level. For sure. On so many wavelengths. Yeah, I, I mean, you learn so many important things, right? Like so often our guys don't show up every night or some guys show up inconsistently and we're still here every night because we're here in service and it's our job to model consistency yeah. to the guys. And just that dedication, you know, that imparts something onto you. Yeah. And it's also, it's a different role. We're not per se here to, some of us therapists, some of us, mm -hmm. you know, other things like that. But it's also a, a mentorship role almost. Sure. It's it's a mentorship, but it's also a family member. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think Yehuda tells me this all the time. Like, a lot of times we're looked to as parents, so, quote unquote, so to right. speak. Because a lot of times there are homes and families where... You know, it, it's not the greatest, you know, we, we learn from our, you know, we learn by, by, by seeing sure. the things around us. Like, you know, some people who have, their parents didn't have a great relationship generally, either, either they're going to have a great relationship with their parents because right. with their wife, because they're going to say, Hey, this is, yeah. you know, this is not their spouse because, you know, this is what I saw in my parents and other people are going to be like, no, they're terrible because that's the only right. thing that they knew. Sure. We are the adults that we become either because of our parents or in spite of them. But there's yeah. no one Which between. is so Freudian and I love Freud. Right, yeah. I mean, it's not, in, I feel like it's kind of in vogue to secretly love Freud again despite everyone hating him. But it, our caregivers model what life should be like for us. Yeah. And, and that, um, and when that's unhealthy, mm -hmm. you know, we have the opportunity to step in. Right. But in such a non overbearing way. Right. I liked what you said about no agenda. Yeah. Right. There's none. There's no, uh, nobody here. I have not met a single staff member. Nobody comes here for the fame. Right. Think about this. Well, if you do come here for the fame, I've got bad news for you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we, we had a meeting Tuesday night last week and, mm -hmm. and we were talking, we were like, you know, and Sonny says this all the time, like, if you if you look at us right at our place right through twenty plus years that we've been around right, so many success stories, so many, uh, very few right, mm -hmm. uh, unsuccessful stories, but pretty much, so many successful stories, right. and we've had a hand in it, mm -hmm. but we never get the credit for it, and Absolutely. it's not something that we want. Right, we're like it's an acceptance going into it. Yeah. It's like it's like think about it like this. Imagine you know by by uh, um, by weddings, right? Uh, we don't have this in in the from world, but uh, Sonny Sonny's Sonny's muscle is better. But I'm going to use mine first because <laughs> I just came up with it and I and I like it. You know, like in non Jewish weddings, I don't think they do really in by Jewish weddings. And not at least that I'm there. You got the ring bearer. Sure. So like we're like the ring bearers. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't have the you can't get married without the ring bearer. But nobody remembers who the ring bearer was. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't get married without the ring bearer, but at the end of the day, the ring bearer is just some dude who's bringing the, re the ring, but he's extremely important because he has the ring. Sani's marshal is like, we're the kvater by a bris. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. the kvater brings the baby to the moil, which is going to be the rabbi, going to be the, the rehab, going to be, if necessary, going to be the therapist, going to be the, you know, the people that are going to, you know, help propel. But without us, the kvater holding the baby, there's no bris. Because what are you going to do? Bris? What are you going to do a bris on? Sure. I yeah. like mine better. I don't know if you like it. <laughs> I don't know. It's dicey. I think you're kind of inadvertently revealing our shared from background by saying we've never seen ring bearers because <laughs> it's so true for me. <laughs> I, yeah, have I've you been to like one, maybe two weddings. Oh, I've never. I haven't been to like a more modern Orthodox wedding where like you would maybe see a ring bearer, which I think is kind of cool, by the way. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Like, like, I mean, by us, the rabbis are the ring bearers, right? Right, they that's whip true. It out or ring. like, or like the the shomer. Yeah, yeah. it's like shomer. Like, I always thought like like one time my friend. I don't know if you've ever been a shomer for somebody. No, I don't no, think so. I was a shomer for my friend, and when he called me to tell me like, "Yo, can you be my shomer mm -hmm. for before the wedding?" I was like, 
Heck yeah, baby. Let's go <laughs> on the show, man. Come on. I mean, I think that's the from version of a best man. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I was psyched because I'm like, okay, I got to trail this guy around. I'm a chauffeur for the day. I get to freaking chill with him before he gets married. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's really cool. Yeah. Well, we, we got totally off topic here. Yeah. But coming back to what you said. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think also a lot of the guys come here when they're at the lowest points in their life. Yeah. And that's almost a hope for us, right? The hope is that once they graduate, they become better than they've ever been. Right. So it's not a point of shame in any way. But a lot of guys are come here while they're in the midst of some sort of identity struggle. Right. Oftentimes there's tensions at home or substances. Yeah, substances or something going on with school. Right. And there's just a lot going on and they kind of just take it as a given almost that they can walk through these doors because that's what all their friends are doing. And then five, ten years later, they go on. Hopefully they, you know, go on to be successful, whatever that looks like. Sometimes it's marriage. Sometimes it's a stable job or opening up a company. And there's almost a reluctance to visit things from like your awkward teenage past. Yeah. So it's like they move on to their best lives, which is what we hope for. And we're, we're not so, I don't, I'm not going to say your age. My age was already thrown out there on the last, Sonny just, Sonny just pushed it out into the world. I was saying we're not so far removed from our teenage years. Absolutely not. But I can say myself right. that there are plenty of things I don't want to revisit sure. from my even, childhood. Even when I had Facebook my teenage. and I was like uh, 22 and Facebook would be like, oh, this is what you did five years ago on this day. Want to see? And I'd be like, absolutely not. Don't, don't show me that. Actually, I would have. <laughs> I would change the privacy setting to only me because I didn't want to get rid of it. Yeah, nobody like right. You look back at yourself five, years, but if if uh, you know, as you were saying, like they couldn't look back, and they could say either like, "Wow," right. you know, it, and and it's okay if it's even negative if you think about it. Like, sure, because there's a lot. There was a lot of negativity happening in their lives, and but almost always there's some sort of positivity involved there. For sure, but what I'm getting to is that. Once they leave and go on to do better with their lives, something that you'll very often see is that they just won't talk about it because it's from the sort of era in their lives that they didn't love or they weren't the most proud of. Yeah. And, you know, our place doesn't get the credit. And like you said, we're not here for that. So that's all right. good. Yeah, nobody nobody comes here to... Nobody comes here to um, get fame or, you know, oh, I'm going to be the guy that's known for being a staff member in Our Place. Right. You come here, like I always say, <laughs> I'm not throwing shade on anybody who works at Our Place, but I always say that you've got to be a special personality to volunteer or to work here. Yeah. You, you have to be somebody who, A, has patience, mm-hmm. or learn it really fast, and B, have to learn how to, how to sometimes be... You know, um, be like not not thrown around because we have to you have to set certain personal boundaries and guidelines. But like, I was, somebody would literally like I don't know if you heard before we came into this room to record the podcast. Somebody somebody called me a not nice name. <laughs> I mean, I didn't hear it, but yeah. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally said to the person, I said, "You know, I love you, right?" And he's like, "Oh, of course I love you." I'm like, and I'm just letting you know. I said. It's not the first time somebody's going to call me that, and it's uh-huh. not the last time I said. But I love every each and every single one of those individuals, and they know that I love them. Mm-hmm. It's just that's an expression of passion. Sure. That's 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 their way of expressing right. themselves at the time. Yeah. Also, if you care to get Freudian, I love Freud. Right? There's totally that thing where they project the sort of caregiver image onto us because they come here and we're the staff members, so to speak, and they go, "Okay, let's." test the boundaries with yeah. these this new family of mine and they discover that really there's very very few things they can do to not be accepted here yeah and even those things you know they they're just things that constitute a danger to our place's continuity in terms of remaining open yeah. but they're not things that mean we reject them or love them any less literally so they can actually say whatever they want to us and we're just like okay yeah like you did that was perfect i yeah. love you yeah, right. Like you're awesome. You know, if you ever want to talk, I'm here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, I think that it's such a. I think it's cool, also, and it helps you build a little bit, of like, of a a, a a skin. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, you're also like, you can finally just like, like say, like, you know, I'm gonna be me, and mm-hmm. like anybody can be me down here. 
Absolutely. Regardless of a staff member or a, a, a teenager or an adult alumni or somebody, like you come down here, if you like riding a unicycle and juggling bowling pins, mm -hmm. we will be like, awesome, you want to come perform by a Hanukkah party. Yeah, there's a space for that. Yeah, anybody. We've even, we've even had members who were, for whatever reasons, were in fights with each and every member of the staff individually and still would come down here. Yeah. And they would hang out and, you know, get dinner and make use of the facilities and so on. Even while being at war. Yeah. They Their were, they, own war, because yeah. none of us are ever at war. Right, but they, like, were not on speaking terms. I, I've seen this happen more than once. Yeah. They were upset. They were dealing with stuff, and they, like, would not speak to Chaim, to Sani, to myself, to Rafi, to anyone. And it would be great to see them. Yeah. I think it's also super cool that, like, Half the time, that at least from what I've heard, because I, I, how long have you been here? Uh, let's see. I came here in 2017. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. This was originally my second year internship in college. Really? And I got hired immediately afterwards. That was very nice of them. Yeah, I, 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 just, I literally, yeah. yeah. And then they decided to, during COVID, there was a break. And then I came back as a therapist. Mm-hmm. Wow. So up until then, I was just doing, I think, what might be your job, program directing? Yes. No. So my job is a little different. But um, I was here for my first internship. Uh -huh. Everybody was raving about it. Joe Yurwitz, all of a shalom, actually. If you want to hear a really cool story, when I was going into, when I was deciding what I wanted to do for school, um, I, I reached, I, I heard about Kiwi Perlman. Sure. And Kiwi told me about Sonny in passing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I'm like, I got to talk to this guy, Sonny. Everybody I'm talking to is raving about this guy. Like he's awesome to like learn from and whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> you can fill me up. <laughs> so More he, seltzer. Oh, careful. Oh, seltzer on oh, oh, it's on the, the yeah, we, I broke, I broke my own rule. We have rules in the studio. <laughs> By the way, for those listening, and I say this every podcast, you do hear outside noises. I love it. We'll get to that at some point. But I remember talking to, um, I, I spoke to Joe Urowitz, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. my father's friend. And I'm like, I got to get, I sent him an email. I, Can you put me in contact with the Sonny guy? Then 20 minutes. I mean, I don't know if you knew Joe for that. That was, sure, he always yeah. did things. He was really, he was a doer. Um, right away, I had Sonny's number and I was on the phone with Sonny and we were schmoozing. And then I was, it was really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And fast forward like four or five months, I'm looking into my first internship. And I actually spoke to a different uh, intern that was here for a while. If you know Yosef Yaakov, mm -hmm. he was an intern. He, he actually, he, he learned with me when I was 10 oh, or 11. Wow. Yeah. He was my cover. So we always stayed in touch. I think I remember you saying that when he came down here. Yeah. 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 And he, um, he said, yo, come here. Like whatever. So I reached out to Yehuda. Um, and I was here for six, seven, eight months. And then one of the guys told me, he's like, we always have these interns and these volunteers that come down here. They're here for like a year. And like some of us, we become close to them and then they just disappear. Yeah. And I knew like I was going to try and find a clinic for my second internship and whatever it is. But I also knew to myself that I would try at least to come in twice a month. Because once I build relationships, mm -hmm. I try to maintain them. Sure. And I did. And wow. I took a second internship somewhere else and I would still try to come down here. Sometimes yeah. I wasn't able to do two times a month and sometimes I did three times a month. Yeah, but I remember not seeing you and then all of a sudden you were around again and I was like, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I took like a, I don't know, maybe it was like a, a month break or like a month and a half break. Mm -hmm. Cause like I was trying to figure things out, like not f figure things out school wise, not like life wise. I'm, a, I'm still trying to figure things out life wise. <laughs> 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 totally vulnerable and okay for saying that. Yeah, I mean, have you met the social worker that has their life together? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then actually Sonny approached me and he said, you know, we're doing this new teen thing. You know, we want to separate it 14 to 21 and we want, you know, I want you to be the clinical director. I'm like, so Sonny, you know, I'm, I'm graduating school um, mm -hmm. in a month. Um, are you sure? He's like, yeah, don't yeah. worry. I'll ease you into it. I'll take care of it. You'll, I'll supervise you. And, and so far, he's been awesome. Sonny is a raging maverick. For those who don't know him, he just does his own thing in such a wild way. That's yeah. so different. He's his own maverick, meaning like certain people are maverick for their country. Uh -huh. He's a maverick for Sonny. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so he he like said to, and i'm like awesome and i don't view it's so funny because like i can totally see how he did this for so long mm -hmm. because it's not like i'm dealing with bureaucracy 
and paperwork and clinical administrative things or whatever it is. Like I, I have my sessions. I, I, you know, I, I do the things that I'm supposed to. You know, I, I, I deal with getting guys into yeshiva, talking to parents, rehab, other stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, like I just could come down here and I was literally playing FIFA with the guy. Uh-huh. Like, how many people can say that for their job, where they're in a position of clinical director, that sort of thing? I, but I don't like to look at the title, whatever it is. Course, I just look right. at it as like you know, I'm coming down here and I'm you know, oh, it happens to be whatever. Right. But like, I have an awesome team. We work together. Uh-huh. You know, my coworkers, Danielle and Bruce. It, it's awesome, day in day out. When we have meetings, it's fun. When we plan stuff, it's fun. How how many people could say that? Not a lot. It, it, not a lot at all. Um, See, even to highlight that, I mean, last night, getting personal on the podcast. Oh, baby. It always seems important to acknowledge that. Yeah. But I, was, I love vulnerability. <laughs> I mean, this is less vulnerable and more personal. But, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, Micah, you could always get vulnerable here. Thank you. You know, this does feel like a safe space. It's supposed to be. That's it's amazing. because the office, it's the aura of needing to be redone. <laughs> It's also Sani's office, not just any office. Right. Actually, yeah, I bug him about it. I call it our office. Our office. To I Sani, I go, can we go to our office? Sani would be so much happier if it wasn't his office. I know. Sani doesn't want any titles. He, you know he doesn't have keys to this place? Yeah. He's had to come to me to borrow keys, and I didn't have any either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's Aaron fun. hates it. It's funny also, because I'm not big into titles either, but like sure. when I talk to parents, they're like, oh, so what do you do? So I'm like, well, technically, like this, though. Oh, what do you? I'm like, okay, you want a title? Here's a title. But regardless, mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I come what do you ch- do with such a problematic question? Yeah. Yeah. Also, like, like, oh, what do you do with yourself? Like, almost always people are asking, like, oh, what do you do for a living? Like, right. Or, like, what do you do with yourself? Like, it's not my life. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? Like, my job is not my life. But I think here it's different. This is different. This is much different. Like, how many people could say, back to you, personal. Right, no, so I want to hear is, about your personal life. This is highlighting what I was saying. Yeah, let me just get comfortable. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Oh. Oh, this you is look great. so much more comfortable. You should know the past couple of times that I was doing this, I was super uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. We're still we're still working out the kinks in here. I just, appreciate you giving me the more uncomfortable. Chair. No, actually, I sat in that chair last time. Really? Yeah. Uh, this is Pod Mic One, mm-hmm. the one that I'm using. It's just, it, it means sure. it's yeah. plugged in, right? But um, I sat in that one last time. I was actually more comfortable. You can adjust the mic. I'm happy with where it is. You think it should be closer? No, I'm no, I'm saying if you want to lean back, it goes down. It. it, it uh, it's all right. no, okay. Anyways, you were saying. So, last night I co-facilitated a group, a sort of trauma treatment group for adults, and this was out in Jersey. You know, mm-hmm. I wound up getting back much later than anticipated. It was a late afternoon, evening thing. Yeah. I wound up getting home at three o'clock in the morning. Wow. If that. In fact, I missed my supervision this morning, which. It's the first time it's ever happened. You missed after you switched groups? After I switched groups, I emailed at like 3 a.m. and I apologize. It's never happened since I've committed to being a part of it. Yeah. It's a highlight of my every other Mondays. Right? (laughs) It's sidebar. The supervision is so good. It's awesome. But there was no question about not coming in here until 11 o'clock at night. No matter how tired I am. It's like, it's not like you were saying, it's not like going to work and doing paperwork. It's going to our place. It's just what I do. It's awesome because like, you come here after a long day and there's like this awesome level of like, um, I can come here and if, even if for a half hour, I need to like, just take a chill. Mm-hmm. You can do that. Yeah. Even just go into a corner, do what needs to get done, mm-hmm. go make a phone call and then you're right back in it. Absolutely. I, th- I think it's just so cool. I just, I, I can't, I can't um, stop always saying that this um, this work for me mm-hmm. just doesn't feel like work. Yeah, and that's the ideal for me anyway. Yeah, 100%. Um, okay, so why don't you tell us... Just one more thing on that. I've even had it where I needed a break, and I was like, you know what? I know I'm technically on shift, whatever that means at our place. Right. I got to go like get an ice cream. Yeah. So like, you know, ice cream house on East 18th. Yeah. So I just, you know, one of the guys was like walking around looking kind of down. And I was like, hey, want to come grab an ice cream? And we just walked out of our place and, you know, got an ice cream, which right. is one of the most our place interactions you it's can have. It's literally the most our place interaction yeah. in the world. And I think that it's so, um, I think like I, I had a, I, I had a thing 
um, something happened. Um, I was talking to somebody, whatever it is. Like we were in the middle of a conversation. And in the middle of the conversation, I'm like, I'm like, you know, why don't we just go like, you know, grab, grab a, an ice cream also. It was in the middle of like an intense conversation. I'm like, let's go grab, let's go grab an ice cream. We didn't talk about anything uh-huh. that, about the conversation um, until we got back into our place. It was yeah. like an interlude. It was right. like, you know, you go to a Broadway show uh-huh. and they have like a... The intermission. Intermission. Sure. It was like, all right, we're having a really intense conversation. Let's hold off for 15 minutes, eat a ton of delicious ice cream, right. and then just like get back to it. Yeah. Um, and that's really the thing about not having an agenda, right? Like so many people I know... There's air quotes here, but they work with Bahram who are struggling, and they don't even you know? get me. Don't even get me started. <laughs> and they ask me about our place and how it is that we get the Bahram to become from again or something. And like there, we don't push the from kite here. We push nothing. <laughs> there is nothing right. here that is pushed in the any way. The statement is that we are here for the guys. Yeah, and whatever that looks like, and mm-hmm. it's grabbing ice cream and just talking about nothing. Sometimes it, we are the um, the bungee cord. <laughs> I said this last time. Um, we are that cable that you know when a guy's free falling, uh-huh. right? We're the cord all the way at the end. Like you, you you're sure. about to hit the ground, and then you stop. Right, you rebound. You didn't know we were here the whole time. Right. I think also Sonny added on the part we we talked about this during the podcast that I was on. That also you know that there's a cord attached to you. Right. You know there's something attached to you. you. Know, right. And even if you're terrified while you're falling, because it feels like everything's just flying, somewhere in the back of your head you have that reassurance. Yeah. And it's just a simple cord. A cord's right. not doing anything. Uh-huh. Cord's just holding you, pulling you back yeah. up. Yeah. That's that, the rebound. That's a great... Did you come up with that analogy? No, Sonny came up with that's it. so good. Yeah. You that came up with a different one, but Sonny came up with that one. <laughs> um, so the time that you're here, right? So you've been, you've been a therapist for what? Two years here? Two and a half? I started working as a therapist here in towards the end of COVID. So probably, yeah, something like that. Okay. So generally you, you work with, with the older guys, the younger guys? Whoever wants to walk in. I have my, well, as close as it gets to being consistent for our place. Yeah. Right. Like my regulars. By the way, th- th- that's also something different. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like in a normal, I mean, we if, if you want to talk about this. Sure. Does it ever get frustrating? Because like if you, you, you have a private practice yourself, right? Yeah, I see my own clients. Right, outside of our place. Uh-huh. Right. In general terms, when, when you're having a private practice, right? If a client doesn't show up, right. it's the first time, I guess, from what I understand, is excused. Second time is automatic build, right? Uh, different people have different policies. Different, different people policies, have different things. But that's generally what I do. Right. You cancel within less than 24 hours. Right. You're, you're built. Uh-huh. Because I could use my time for something else. Here, if somebody doesn't show up right. for a week, do you give his spot away? Well, the spot is dedicated for the guys. Right. This guy, the way I view it is, is that this guy has dibs on the spot. Right. So he's allowed to go. My spot. I want an hour from you. And sure, it's my pleasure. Even if he hasn't been here in three weeks. Yeah, absolutely. He could just be like, "Hey, I'll be in this week." It's happened after months sometimes. And uh, by the way, that that's that's the point that I wanted to get to uh-huh. is that. Again, no agenda. Right. This is my time. Sure. This is when I, I told you that I will see you. If I have, if you don't show up, whatever, your spot will always be now. Right. Does it ever get frustrating? Well, the only times it's gotten choppy, usually it's a pleasure. Because, again, the time is for the guys. It's not about me. 7 to 11 on Monday nights is not my time. Right. So it, it's possible that at 8 p.m. I'll be seeing our place member X. But it's also possible I'll be hanging out with our place members Y, Z, A, and B in the right. smoking or music room. There's really no rule. Right. If someone told me that they needed time specifically, then they get the time slot. But what's happened is that people have gone away for months, and then other people have wanted the slot. And I try, as long as someone doesn't formally terminate with me, I try to keep that spot open. Mm-hmm. But it's happened where I've had like, you know, too many people squished in. Right. And of course, when on a night where I have four clients lined up, the guy who hasn't been here in two months always messages me and goes, hey, I'm, are you in tomorrow night? And the answer is always, of course. Right. You know, and somehow we make it happen. Right. And 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 most people would be like frustrated in a sense because like you have a spot, show up. 
but here, right? It's we're here for you. Never crossed my mind. Right. It never crossed my mind to be frustrated. Well, well, you know why? Because you were originally working here as a volunteer and an intern, right? Before you became a therapist. Yeah. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you know if your reaction would be different if you weren't exposed to to this place before. I don't want to put you on the spot right. here. No, I'm Because this is all theoretical. It. Right. So I don't know if that's specifically why it is that it doesn't frustrate me. But overall, I think the sort of self-understood mission statement when you join our place is that our job is to be consistent and the guy's job is to not be consistent. And the less consistent they're able to be, the more love it means they need. Yeah. Right. So it's so, not for everyone. I've... I know some very upstanding people who came here to either volunteer or intern. And after two days, they were like, this is not my place. Yeah. They immediately know it. Yeah, I, I, I always I always find, <laughs> last night, there was a guy coming to, to volunteer, to sign up. Like tonight, it was a quiet night. Nobody was blasting music, nothing, whatever. Last night, this guy comes in to volunteer. There was heavy rap blasting on uh -huh. a huge speaker. You couldn't hear yourself. I cannot hear myself sure. think. Like the floor vibrates. Yeah. You know? And right. I'm like, this is so funny because this is the perfect night for a guy to come in and see what it's like. Uh -huh. Because some guys would, you know, turn around on their tail and run. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're not built for this place, mm -hmm. then you something will happen that night. Because sure. the forces at work don't want you working here. Because at the first thing, the first event that'll happen, that'll technically cause somebody right. to turn away, you won't, you'll turn and run. But if sure. you're learning to expect something like yeah. that which i think is 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 super cool yeah this you guy know? i was uh, in yeshiva with shlomi zions he coined the term when schmutz hits the fan oh he's that famous guy on uh yeah he travels he he's on in the stuff. army uh -huh. so you're friends with some famous people well we were in yeshiva together i mean he's not madonna but <laughs> <laughs> i think he'll be tickled pink by this we once went to madrid together i think it was yeah yeah, yeah on the layover to yeshiva Great travel, buddy. Oh yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. Is he one of those guys like uh, that whips out travel facts? He writes about his travels, right? But I'm yeah. saying, like, is he the type like, as you're taking off from Madrid? I've also stopped over in Madrid. Mm -hmm. Like, as you're taking off from Madrid Airport, I'll look at you and I'll be like, "So did you know that in 1997, Madrid Airport was be began construction with the first runway, <laughs> runway T4?" He has different types of travel facts, like. Okay, so we're going to Madrid, and there's this one kosher steakhouse, and it's going to be amazing, and we're going to go there. <laughs> so he's the best type of, 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 of traveler. Yeah, if you're doing any sort of from traveling to anywhere off, slightly off the beaten path, he's the guy you want to go with. So you went to Yeshiva in Israel? Yeah. Where? So. <laughs> if you want to. Yeah. I started out at a place called Midrash Shmuel. I've heard Mad of it. Yeah. Well, there's a camp called Camp MS. Right. Yeah, yeah. of course. Uh-huh. Ellie Merenstein. He ran runs this place. he no. runs Prozdor. Yeah, he's got Prozdor, right? Yeah, this incredible summer camp. It was wild. Yeah, MS. Yeah. yeah. I don't it stood for Midrash Shmuel because it was based out of their campus. No way. Isn't that mind blowing? Whoa. I had no idea. Yeah, it was like a play on words. It's a joke. That's like somebody else told me a different play on words recently and I was like, Whoa. Mind mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. So I went to Camp MS and like three weeks and I called my parents and I was like, I'm staying in Israel. This is it. You were, you were 17. Six, I think 16. so. Yeah. I want to say I was 17. Right. My parents were like, what? And I was like, yeah, no, I'm here now. So I started off by going, by going to Midrash Shmuel. Right. About three weeks into Elzman. It's really not a Hasidish yeshiva. No. About three weeks into Elzman, I took off to Uman. <laughs> Legend. <laughs> it, it's a four or five week Elzman. Yeah. Yeah. I, I missed north of a quarter of it. <laughs> and I just didn't go back to Midrash Shmuel. I went to this place in Telstone that I, I don't think exists anymore. Okay. Or Chadash. And that's where I met Shlomi. Wow. Special place. They had this idea that there are kids who like learning and who have good heads, but don't want to learn all day. And at some point, this was revolutionary. At some point, if you weren't interested in learning, they would lump you in together with the people who weren't capable of learning. And you had some very talented, able people being placed together with people who needed any sort of intellectual, you know, uh, special assistance. Right. For lack of a better phraseology. Oh, yeah. 
That's a right. that's a really cool. Uh, that's like revolutionary to a point. Yeah, th- this was absolutely revolutionary. So you would learn in the first half of the day, and the second half of the day you would do would there was like a woodworking shop, and you would be there were all these different skills you could learn. There was a music room with uh, guitar teachers and drum teachers, like we have here. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's that's the that's like it took so long for yeshivas to recognize that, and now every pretty much every yeshiva has some sort of outside outside resource yeah. where there's other things involved because not everybody is cut out for learning. Not everybody is cut out to sit it's in a also chair the whole day. probably not the most efficient way to learn. No. Because at some point... And not, know, just, not just learning slum. Torah, but anything, also anything. Right. Yeah, in, in general, we're segueing a little, but that's yeah. fine. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Like the least efficient way to learn is to sit from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and try to cram yeah. your head. You need breaks. You need to engage in some sort of self-care. Yeah. Right. So, and something something also stimulating for the mind in a different way. When you utilize other parts of your mind, yeah. then that can um, help rest those course, other parts. Yeah. Physical health, mental health, and spiritual health are all, to me at least, or maybe physical health, emotional health, and spiritual health. They're sort of three legs of a table. Right. You know, I want to get back to I want to get back to self care after right. because I think that that's that's something really important that's not discussed enough with teenagers and in high school sure so 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 you went so to this yeshiva this yeshiva you met shlami zions i met shlami zions and a couple of other cool cats we partied <laughs> <laughs> well for what yeshiva bachram partying is sure we would go on these teolim and, that's awesome you know, repelling and so on stuck out the rest of the year there went to um camp ms again this time as a sort of staff member okay i guess I think Ellie was just being nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after you ditch him. By the way, it's so it, you were like, you had some in a claw that you got out of Medr Shmuel. Because like pretty much everybody that yeah. goes there, you are trapped. You go there, you get married there, you live in Israel after there. And you learn in Medr Shmuel after. Yeah, of course. Like I know people that have been there for 15 years, yeah, 20 I've, years. I've, yeah, there, there are lifers. Not you know, to say there's anything bad lives. about that. Right. But yeah. Sure. Um, then after that, I went to Asha Torah for a couple of weeks. Awesome. Hung out there, got to meet some. Also, the rabbis there were really phenomenal. You know? I happen to love Aish. Yeah, so we had Rabbi Yemtov Glazer. Heard of him? Phenomenal. He. I really credit him with, in many ways, initiating me on this sort of process of self discovery, self awareness, and self growth. Really? He did a lot for me back, for my young teenage self. Shout out Rabbi Yemtov Glazer. Glazer, yeah. There was a rabbi, Mutti Berger. Some phenomenal rabbis. Wow. And then after I spent you know, the second eldest man in Israel at H. I went to a yeshiva in Tzfas called Shalom Rav with Avshi Wenga. Cool that you went to Tzfas for yeshiva. Yeah. I'm jealous on so many levels. So, you know, Tzfas is my second favorite place in the world. Really? Yes. The favorite? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot now. No, I have a favorite place in the world. It's Yushalayim, but... Uh-huh. My second favorite place in the world. I mean, probably maybe the first place in the world is probably my bed. Just because like, <laughs> I go to sleep at night. It's 1130 at night. I get to, you know. But um, it's it's really Yushalayim and Tzfas. And, and Tzfas over anywhere else. It could, not even Brooklyn. Not even my house. Not even here. I mean, this is this is top three. It's like Yushalayim, Tzfas, our place. Uh, but like, I, I don't know. There's something majestic yeah. and esoteric. I'm using a lot of big words here. And and just sublime and like you feel different when you go to Tzfas, I find. Yeah, there's a spiritual tradition about just the ear in Tzfas. You know, being, I mean, in general, there's this idea that the ear in Israel is yeah. just, you know, Avir Da'ara. Avir Da'ara Machima. But then yeah. there's four different cities that are associated with the elements. Right, it's and like Tzfas. I think Tzfas is the Chevron, city of the ear. Right. Chevron, Tveria, and Yushalayim. Yushalayim, correct. Yeah, I saw these cool water, pictures and restaurants. And so right. <laughs> But Tzfas is special, like, I don't know if it's the air there, the vibe, the way it's constructed. Yo! <laughs> I love it. So you went to Yeshiva and Tzfas there, which I'm utterly jealous about, because you probably rocked those stairs. Barefoot, usually. Oh! <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Did you have Did you have also, at that point, you had a ponytail? I did not, not yet. That came later. You didn't Isaacify it? I did not Isaacify it, no. But you had a ponytail at some I actually, I'm like the only person who went to Tzfas with curly bays. 
and cut them off in swas. Oh, really? Everyone does the opposite. Right. Right. Everyone comes with like short hair and either grows long hair or pays. Like crazy long hair with like yeah. these pays that come down to their uh-huh. kneecaps. Sure. And wears like like white on Shabbos and like these like cloaks during the week. I mean, these <laughs> yeah. people are baller. Swas was all right, yeah. That's awesome. So you got a lot of cool experiences there. Yeah. Yeah, I, w- I, I would think so. That's so awesome. I, I happen to think I spent three years in Israel. I happen to think that it's so integral to part of your growth. Even if, even if you get, even if you get brainwashed and you have to come back and go Maybe the opposite way. If you go get brainwashed, right? But I'm saying, and you come back and then you you settle down. Like I always found that, like you come, you go to Israel and you come back, and there's like a honeymoon period of like three months when you get back from Israel. Right. And then you like ease yourself back into society. Right. Like and, if you flipped out, you mean? Yeah. You and you sort of like get right. back to normal. And even if you, but you learn to, if you really were able to retain those values, regardless of, of your religious status or anything like that. Sure. Or regardless of where you are. Mm-hmm. But there's this like period where you, you retain certain things. Yeah. And certain. I, I mean, I'm a little wary of saying anything, any one thing is integral to someone's growth as a whole. But I think that if you are not from Israel and you spent a year or two there as a bacher or as a teenager or what have you not, it, there's no way it wasn't in some way or another a formative experience. Yeah, I'm happy we agree on that. <laughs> but um, there, was, there was something I wanted to get back to. Oh, self-care. Self-care. To me, that's, that's, that's extremely important. Um, you know, let me just sit up. Oh. Um, self-care. Mm-hmm. Some of when when you were in high school, uh-huh. when I was in high school, no one ever brought up self care. Nobody ever said the night before a huge myth, regardless of how um, studious you were, right, mm-hmm. or anything like that, or you had a tough day at school. Nobody ever said go home, make yourself food that you like, go do an activity that's important to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, let's first introduce. So, was, Micah, you're 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 more of a seasoned professional than I am. So why don't, why don't we first introduce the topic of what self-care is? Well, you're so into it. Why don't you take it away? No, We're all ready. I want you to take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have this fight. No, you take. No, I say. <laughs> well, I, I have a rule where I don't do third courtesies. Okay. So I, I tell someone you do it and they go, no, you do it. I don't go there. No, you do it again. That's, that's a third courtesy. So you just threw this back on me. No, no. I'm happy to go ahead is what I'm saying. Oh, okay, I'm so not going to throw it back on you. Okay. So, first, before we get into self-care, let's distinguish or differentiate between self-care and selfishness. Because so often I hear people conflate the two and say, well, being self-care is selfish, or even worse uh, to me. By so, the way, there, there's a reason why you're doing this, because I never would have said something. Like that. <laughs> I would have just jumped right. But yeah. Right. I also hear people sort of rationalize what they believe to be selfish behavior or self-care behavior by saying, well, sometimes you have to be selfish. It's important to understand that these two things are different. When you engage in self-care, you're doing something. You're engaging in an activity, a hobby, taking a break with express purpose in mind. You sort of want to honor yourself and recognize that as a human being, you have limitations you need downtime, you need to relax, to recharge, and to be the most optimal version of yourself, both for yourself and for others. It's important to take time for yourself. That's not in any way selfish. As a therapist, my entire professional life is oriented around helping others. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I were to say, show up to the office for 60 hours a week and not engage in any self-care. I would be burnt out. Right. Right. Not being able to help others. Right. So in fact, it's the opposite of being selfish. It's what enables me to help others in many ways. Right. Right. So, so that's completely different from being selfish, where you're disregarding the well-being of others for your own benefit. Right. 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 So, so that concept of taking time to recharge your batteries, uh-huh. save yourself from burning out. And that can mean watching a sports game, anything in the world. So that's not discussed. Sure. I feel like that's something that, you know, there's not a chinuch round table, right. but I feel like that's something that should be, like if they're not bringing it up in schools, then we can bring it to the table. We can tell mm-hmm. teens, 
you know, and, and our place can be used as an example of that if that's something that you can use. But there has to be some sort of, you know, I, I talk to guys sometimes. Like, there's some really studious guys here. Mm -hmm. They really put in their effort. And I'm and like, they come in here like, oh, I can't come in tonight. I can't come on this trip because like I'm studying. And I'm like, okay, so like you're going to study the whole night? Yeah. I'm like, what are you going to do afterwards? Like for yourself? Like what are you going to, when are you going to take time to do something that'll, you know, uh, break your mind out of it, give yeah. your body a chance to relax? And I think it's just not discussed enough. Sure. And even if you have that drive and that desire and you disregard the idea of burnout and say that doesn't apply to me, there's something to be said for the fact that I don't know if you've ever sat down and tried to read 200 pages from a book in one shot. Oh, been there, done that. I'm a, I'm a yeah. voracious reader. But at some point, your eyes just kind of glaze over. Yeah. No matter how interesting the content material. It might be 50 pages. It might be 75. It might be 300. But at some point, your eyes glaze over and you stop absorbing new material and you cripple your ability to engage in any sort of memory retention. Oh, I didn't know that. That's that's For, for most people, that's how it works because we're human beings and we have limited attention spans and we have physiological needs that we're often ignoring once we hit a certain point. That's so interesting. Yeah. Your brain goes into autopilot at that right. point. And like, then your eyes just gloss over and you stop absorbing anything. You've scanned 15 pages, but you don't know what you've read. Yeah. You ever, you ever heard of um, road hypnosis? It rings a bell. Remind me. So you ever been on a really long drive mm -hmm. on the highway? Sure. And I you're in, you're, you're, in, you're in cruise control. Right. And well, I'm a big cruise control. I don't like driving. Uh -huh. I'm a big cruise control guy. I put the car, put, put if Sani were in here, we both know what he would be saying right now. Said, My Tesla drives itself. This Tesla <laughs> is the coolest car, and it's navy. Um, <laughs> it's got a frunk. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, and my trunk is bigger than his trunk and his trunk combined, but he has a frunk. Yes. By the way, our place is probably the only uh, workplace in the world where we can get together in our place office using our place equipment, make jokes about our boss's car. <laughs> in good spirits in good spirit, and he'll love and it. He'll, yeah. Everybody will love it. No, it's true. By the way, he told me. When you I, just put a lot of pressure on him to love this, by the way. <laughs> Son, you have to love it. Five if stars. Not, like, five stars on every platform. If not, we strike tomorrow. It, <laughs> we whoa, pick at the Tesla. Whoa. whoa. <laughs> oh, we'll be here tomorrow night. Oh, great. Oh. I won't. Will you bring spray? Will you send spray paint? <laughs> oh, we're pushing it a little bit here. But he actually, I, I mentioned to him about the idea, and, and, and I'm like, yeah, so I won't, I'm going to be recording during hours that we're open. And he's like, oh, for sure. Right. He's like, of course you're going to do it while we're open, uh -huh. because not only am, are we going to have guys one, you know, soon, yeah. anonymously, obviously, uh, I'm going to have to find a good voice changer or not. The voice changer on here is crazy; it makes you sound like a, a, a scary monster. This an, this this thing has a voice changer on it. We don't we don't use the pads during the podcast because it'll see. get out of hand. There's an air it horn. Uh, yeah, let's. There's an air horn on there, like you know, in a club. E -e -e -e. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, I think for the sake of this conversation being productive in any way, we should not press any. No, of nothing whatsoever. Not <laughs> <laughs> but oh, so getting back to the to the road. So oh. like you're sitting there and driving there, and then all of a sudden you just you're you're making corrections and driving without even realizing right. it. Yeah, you're you know? in like a zen place. Yeah, right? yeah. it's so funny because by me, for some people it could take an hour, mm -hmm. for some people it could take an hour and a half. For me, if it's a calm drive i am in road hypnosis within 20 minutes sure. i just i just get in there and i have my music on i'm in my zone i have to think that this i i find this something self-care related to i happen to love music uh -huh. to just sitting in the car and listening to music to me it's like it's like part of the um it's like making the experience which i again i don't like driving so mm -hmm. much and it just makes it so much more palatable. And it, like when I'm in road hypnosis, like my brain is on autopilot doing all the mm -hmm. functions, but I'm thinking, I'm in my own place. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, just I'm in a flow state. Yeah, yeah. I'm being mindful, mm -hmm. which like I always thought would be scary when driving. Can you imagine like just being mindful and having like, like meditating basically while you're driving? <laughs> sure. Like, and we didn't even touch IFS. <laughs> Can you imagine? Have you ever had it? A client try to do IFS with you while they're driving on a phone session. No, because I'm not an IFS practitioner uh. yet. Uh, <laughs> have you Have you tried both as uh, as the therapist and as the client? Wow. Yeah, it's not smart. 
No, I feel like it's not like this part. Whoa! <laughs> How do you even? So what are you feeling? Mm, I'm feeling. Oh my god! What's that? <laughs> <laughs> or like you're waiting by a stop sign for ten right. minutes. Uh-huh. Uh, I think the uh, speaking of stop signs, of waiting there. I think I was talking to somebody one time, and they were telling me oh, that they were high. Mm-hmm. Whatever they were in a state of, of altered consciousness. Altered consciousness. I was right. going for that, nice. and they they were waiting for it by a stop sign, waiting wait, waiting for it to turn green. Mm-hmm. Second there. No, isn't that what they say? The difference between the drunk person and the high person is altered state of consciousness. Yeah, that's exactly yeah, right. You right? Uh, what is it? Drunk people wait for the. Uh, they don't. They, think they the don't red stop. Lights are green. <laughs> the altered state of consciousness. Wait for the stop sign right. to turn green. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, bef- as we're gonna wrap up, so I've I've one question for you, uh-huh. which I think is really important. Um, in your time that you've been here. Mm-hmm. What have you um, discovered about working with teens, working with mm-hmm. this population, whether it be about yourself, an opinion you formed, um, an epiphany, or something like that? Has there, has there been um, uh, something that, that has changed within you in your time here? You know, the problem with this question is that there is all this pressure on me to be profound. <laughs> no, you don't have to be. I don't, <laughs> but let me it, think about it. You know, it's kind of a lesson that I've learned earlier in life. But one of the big takeaways from working here is that it's really, really important to be mindful of even the smallest of interactions you have with someone. So often I've had it where someone's been like, you know, that one thing that that one person told me this one time seven years ago, this was mind-blowing, changed my life. But if you go and ask that person about it, they don't even remember having said that, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like an off-the-cuff comment. They were just riffing. And with all these interactions that we have with everyone here, we have thousands and hundreds of thousands of opportunities to have that one meaningful moment. You know, Like, if I come down here and have one meaningful interaction with someone, I've done good for myself, I think. But it's so important to be mindful of the impact that we can have on others. And, and it can be just riffing. Right? It can be just riffing. It can be, you know, noticing that someone's hanging out in a corner and complimenting their hoodie. Yeah. You know, giving them a high five. And it's got to be genuine. That's my rule for compliments. Yeah. One insincere compliment and the person will never believe anything you tell them ever again. It's for sure. Mm-hmm. But that, that point hits, hits, hits home. And I think it's also that a lot of times, like, you know, every, like before I got into this work, uh-huh. You hear all these like one minute inspiring, you know, meaningful minute, uh, yeah. all these things, like they're awesome. Oh, this guy one time said something, whatever it is. Uh-huh. And you're like, okay, that's cool. Like whatever it is. But like here we're in an opportunity where we can accomplish that uh-huh. and not even realize it. Right. And we're not even trying to. Yeah, that's the like, idea. Like <laughs> I don't want to be in a story one day, uh-huh. you know, like I'm, you know, I'm doing what I can. Sure. Will it be cool? Sure. You know, to mm-hmm. be in uh, 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 the splendor of the Maggid or, the, you know, any of these right. stories from the heart. I mean, yeah, like whatever, yeah. but like, but you know, that's if, not if why I'm here. If any of those people tried, I suspect they wouldn't be in those books. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's those, it's mm-hmm. those, yeah, that, that really hits home. I mean, it's true. It's one little interaction, one change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that makes it all worth it. Such a difference maker. Right. Like, if you spent years in graduate school and then had a 40 year uh, career as a therapist and let's say not you of course but let's say someone who underwent this process was a mediocre therapist every single day of those 40 years but just once had one empowering positively impacting conversation with someone it was all worth it yeah no for one person's life yeah yeah it's all worth it for. I don't. I don't think we can top that bombshell. <laughs> I don't think we can top that. That seriousness. Um, and with that, I'm going to thank you thank for joining you. us, Michael. Hope, well, let's do this again sometime. Sounds I'd like to have a to panel at some point if I can get panel. more mics in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just get it. Like do like a meeting sort of session, or just shooting the breeze and talking mm-hmm. about you know experiences and things like that. But um, this was awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm not going to ask you to rate which one was better. 
<laughs> I hear the machinery on this podcast is outstanding. This is a brand new machine. Some might call this the Tesla of podcast machinery. <laughs> Thank that, you again. Yeah. Have a great night. Enjoy. Enjoy.